Um, I'm going to give you a couple of spicy quotes, and then I'm going to kind of go into the details and the bones, and hopefully we'll have a lot of time at the end for some questions. And, and please don't soft pedal the questions. I, uh, give me the hard ones. First of all, spicy quote number one. In Iraq, the military operation there is the best supported, best supplied military operation in history. And this is due to the innovative use of the private sector. Quote number two, international peace operations. The private sector is revolutionizing international peace operations, and no peace operation could succeed without the private sector today. Here's some realities. First of all, all militaries have limited resources, even the US military, the largest military in the world. And it's a battle between the capability and efficiency. But in general, with the militaries, you don't go for efficiency, you go for capability. The US military is the most capable organization in the world. It can overthrow countries, it can change diapers in New Orleans, it does whatever you tell it to do, and it's designed to be able to do that. It is not designed to be a cost-effective organization. Most peacekeeping is Westernless, which is to say the U.S., the West, um, we do not send our own troops to do peacekeeping in places we don't care about, which is generally the humanitarian peacekeeping missions. So if you go to Eastern Congo today, you're not going to find any Western militaries on the ground there maybe a handful of Canadians and Norwegians, but you're not going to find any units that will be from the West. They're all going to be from, from the South. Um, so essentially, we're leaving the most difficult, most complex peacekeeping missions to the poorest nations in the world today. So when you need to find equipment and specialized skills and capacity and transport, where do you go today? <laughs> go to the private sector. And Full disclosure, Halliburton is not a member of the International Peace Operations Association, but it's a wonderful example and, and it makes a point. And essentially it's the private sector that's filling these gaps, it's doing these things that need to be done to make peacekeeping and stability operations successful. Why do we use the private sector in the, we call it the peace and stability operations industry, but I think a more neutral term is contingency contractors, people who work in contingency operations. The number one reason that we look to the private sector is surge capacity. It's a reality, you start a mission, a peacekeeping mission, stability operation, and you realize you don't have enough of something. You don't have enough specialization, you don't have enough transport, you don't have enough uh, logistics, you don't have enough of something. You need to like gear up very quickly and you go to the private sector and they have unlimited resources. The military has limited resources. They're good resources, but they're within the military, they're within the uniforms, and they can do certain things, but ultimately you have to go outside for a lot of the capacity and the capabilities and so on. So it's a surge capacity, and we sometimes call it the oh crap phone call. State Department decides to do something, gets going, and halfway through they realize we need a bunch of engineers. Oh crap, who do we call? And they pick up the phone and they call a logistics company or a construction company and, and get the services they need done. So it's essentially, it's a surge, it's ability to carry out these policies uh, given, given to it by the government. Um, the contingency contractors bring a lot of experience to these missions because most of them, or at least the key people in these companies that work in these areas, are former military themselves. And one of the things that cracks me up, I'm not military. I am a uh, uh, more of an academic background. As, as I say, I, when I go to a conflict or post-conflict environment, I'm not a soldier, I'm a target. Uh, on the other hand, everybody that works with our companies, a lot of them are former military people. They've done their time in the military 10, 20, in some cases more than 30 years in the military. Then they get out and they still have, you know, if you join the military at age 20 and you put in 20 years, you're only 40 years old when you get out, you know? And that's a lot of experience that you've got in those 20 years that has a lot of applicability to peace and stability operations, a lot of value to the private sector that they can bring to their capacities. So you have these retired military people that go into this area and support these sorts of operations. They bring a lot of capabilities. You get a lot of specialization. In the military, you'll generally jump from job to job to job every few, two, three, four years. You're going to be switching jobs, switching commands, switching kinds of operations you do. Once you go into the private sector, you're probably going to be pigeonholed. You're going to be doing one thing, training. You're going to be doing engineering. You're going to be doing logistics, whatever. But that's what you're going to do. So you get a lot more specialization. You may be ex-military, you may have done all these other things, but now you're going to be specialized. And the militaries or peacekeepers are able to tap into that capability and that specialization and all that skill and, and bring it to their own operations on a, on a contingency basis. Flexibility. Uh, private sector just brings enormous flexibility. They can adjust to sizes. They can adjust to requirements. 
the U.S. military, every piece of equipment they have has to be able to work in the Arctic. It has to be able to work in the desert. Um, it's very limited in that sense. If you go to the private sector and you need a certain kind of aircraft, say high altitude helicopters for Afghanistan or something, then the only ones you're going to hire are going to be the ones that work in that particular area. So you get a better quality and you get a, uh, it's a flexibility that you can, you can tap into as necessary for, for governments. There's more control of the private sector and less risk. What do I mean by that? Well, when you hire a company, you're hiring a company to do a specific task or a specific job. And if they don't do it, you can fire them. The interesting thing about for-profit companies is they work for money. And when you stop paying them, they go home. And this has been happening lots of times. It's a great way to control companies because they work for money. They don't just stay around and cause trouble. They can't. They can't afford to do that. So if you stop paying them, they go away. But what about the risk factor? Uh, what's the risk of using these private companies? Well, from a political perspective, the risk is actually lowered when you're using the private sector. You can say, well, let me give you an example. A buddy of mine, Rick, is a uh, uh, special forces medic. He's actually finishing his 32nd year in the military, but he was part of the time he was uh, in the reserves. Uh, he went to work for a company called ICI of Oregon, a helicopter company, and it was supporting peacekeeping operations in Liberia. Now, here was an American company, Russian helicopters, Russian crews, uh, the managers were all American, and they were supporting this peacekeeping mission in Liberia in the mid-1990s that nobody ever heard about. It was not a peacekeeping mission that anybody, that there was any political will to support. The U.S. government was not about to send its own military to do this sort of thing, so we hired a company to provide helicopters to support the West African peacekeepers in Liberia. Well, so Rick is part of this mission. It's a handful of Americans, a handful of Russians, and these helicopters that are providing some very robust support for the, for the uh, Africa, it was a Ecomog peacekeepers there. Uh, if Rick, wearing his t-shirt and blue jeans and flying around in this blue and white Russian helicopter, if he had been shot during that mission, think about this, page 23 of his hometown newspaper, you know, local man injured or killed in West African conflict. Big deal. So there's no real political risk there. However, if Rick, as a reservist, gets called up to go in the military and the U.S. government says, okay, you know, this peacekeeping, this humanitarian mission in Liberia is important now. And we're going to send our military there. So they bring Rick in uniform, put him into a Black Hawk helicopter, and he goes out and he gets shot. Well, now you have a special American Special Forces uh, sergeant shot or killed in, in uh, West African conflict, page one of the New York Times. So by using these contractors, essentially it allows the U.S. government or other governments to carry out policies that are good or bad policies, but they're coming from elected governments, uh, and they do it in a way that doesn't cause as many problems or as many raises as many hackles as using actual militaries. Um, employment of locals, and this is something I'll talk a little bit more about. When the private sector works in conflict, post-conflict environments, it uses as many locals as it can. It hires them and puts them to work. And the number one, well, okay, the number one people that, that you will hire when you're a company is locals because they're cheaper, because they're there, they feed themselves, um, you just look for the talents and you bring that into your organization. If you're not allowed to hire locals or if you can't find the skill sets you're looking for, then you go to the third country nationals, the TCNs we call them. And so those are your Filipinos, your Pakistanis, your Fijians, your Ugandans, uh, Peruvians or whoever. And you get the skill sets from them. If you're not allowed to hire them for whatever reason, usually for security reasons or something, and you have to use Westerners or, God forbid, Americans, uh, it gets really expensive and then you lose a lot of your competitive edge. So for the companies, they're going to use as many locals as they can. And I'll talk a bit more about this. How using locals provides capacity building, provides uh, jobs, provides uh, some, some stability to these sort of peacekeeping operations. And finally, faster, better, cheaper. This is a mantra. These are the three things that the private sector brings to any mission, any, some combination of them because of the skill, because of the specialization, because of the speed that they're able to move on. Uh, it's a number of different reasons why you go to these private companies, but usually it's a mix of these sorts of things. Most of our companies operate on the, on the understanding that they may have to be somewhere in the world in the middle of nowhere within 10 days. Uh, there's very, very few militaries that are able to pull that one off. Uh, and basically our companies live by that. They hate it. They much prefer the six-month warning. <laughs> but if, if they're called by the U.S. government that says we need a, a bridge in the middle of nowhere in 10 days, and they get underway, and they're usually underway in, in, in less than 10 days. Here's how I describe the industry. Uh, I break it into sort of these three general categories. Logistics and support companies, 
Uh, it's it's here, construction, maintenance. These are companies, you're not hiring them to carry weapons. You're hiring them to provide a service to support your mission. Uh, engineering, waste management, strategic transport, flying people in and out of places uh, or around places in helicopters. Um, it it's, can be very mundane. Medical services, water purification, who knows? All sorts of stuff. This category, in terms of our entire industry, that's 90% of us that, that group right there. And these second two categories, which are a little bit more interesting, of course, sexy. Second one is the private security companies. These are the companies you do hire to be armed, or maybe not armed, but certainly providing security for something. A, uh, a person, a place, a thing. They, they protect a noun. And it may be a static site. It may be um, not moving around something they can simply surround with, with local security. Or it may be something mobile, like a convoy. Or it may be somebody you want to protect. A newly elected uh, president or something like that. So you hire those people specifically to provide security. So that's the one that really everybody focuses on. Maybe 5% of our industry globally is that. Last category, this is most interesting, and this is the one I think you're seeing the greatest growth in now, security sector reform and development companies. And whenever you have a peacekeeping operation or a stability operation, you have to have a long-term solution. You have to create some sort of status so that there's some stability. And to get that stability involves training up a military, training up border guards, creating a court system, a legal system that can function. Uh, Re-establishing civil society, uh, rebuilding legal uh, uh, educational systems, all sorts of things. And a lot of this is stuff that NGOs will do if the situation is, is benign enough, but if it's quite dangerous, you end up hiring private companies who then will use the same people as the NGOs, but pay them a little bit more. So those are sort of, again, these two categories together are maybe 10% of the industry. And that first category, the logistics support and, and services, that's really 90% of the industry. This is a list of the IPOA member companies currently. Well, we just added, I think, one or two today. Um, it's, a, it's a mix. You'll see that about a third of our companies are security companies, the PSCs, even though that's only 5% of the industry. Um, and the other two-thirds are everything else, logistics, de-mining companies, Paxton is a moving company, Patriot K9 services, specialized dogs for, for finding landmines and explosives, uh, Toyfer, my favorite company, um, well, don't tell the, tell the rest of the members about that. But Toyfer is a German company. Does anybody know what Toyfer stands for? Came from? The name comes from Toilets for I4. It was <laughs> a company that provides portable toilets. It originally, it was portable toilets for the peacekeeping mission in the Balkans. Uh, because, you know, you got to go, you got to go. So they would provide these portable toilets in these war zones um, and then moved on to do logistics and other things. But uh, it was interesting when I came out of uh, Kabul, uh, out of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, and, Right across the street was all these big garbage bins, and they all had the Toy for logo. I mean, these guys have found this niche in waste man management and war zones, which is, which is amazing. So, anyway, a variety of companies, they do a variety of different things. All right. Oh, my God. Who's exaggerating? When you talk about the industry, when you hear about the industry in the newspaper, when you hear academics talk about the industry, when you hear journalists talk about the industry, who's doing the exaggeration? All right. First of all, my favorite one. What are the trends in the industry? What you see from academics is Gulf War I, there's only 10,000 contractors. Now we have 180,000 contractors. You have this arc, this parabolic arc that's going like this in terms of number of contractors being used in areas of conflict. By the time of our next conflict, every human on Earth will be working as a contractor for it because its arc keeps going up. In fact, we'll be hiring cockroaches to do some of our work. Um, now, if you want to take a real look at the trend, start in World War II. 700,000 contractors worked for, for the U.S. military in World War II. We had 80,000 contractors in Vietnam. Uh, in fact, during the Tet Offensive, the biggest battle in Vietnam, the contractors took a higher percentage of casualties than the military did. Um, during the Balkans, we had more contractors than troops. Again, it depends on the kind of mission. If you're doing a lot of reconstruction work and not so much security, you're going to hire a lot of contractors. They're cheaper. They do the job. They bring in different kinds of equipment. It just makes sense. So the act, contractors are contingency contractors. When you have an operation going on, there's a lot of them. When you don't have anything going on, they disappear. They go back to their day job. Um, 50,000 private security contractors in Iraq. That's the number you hear all the time. Uh, mostly nonsense. And let me put it this way. In the US, we have three times as many private security as we do police. This is normal. You have the same in South Africa, the UK, and so on. 
you have a lot of private security. The person who's at the at the entrance to every building in Washington D.C. making you sign that little book there is a private security person. They may not be armed, but technically they're private security. In Iraq, you have mall cops too. You have these guys who are protecting shops, who are protecting um, various private entities. And you don't want to use the police for that. You don't want to use the military for that. So you hire somebody's cousin or brother or their company or something. So you have a lot of those people. They're Iraqi, doing Iraqi security. For the US military, and I think I know you guys have Gary Motzik here, and he's really good on these numbers. And the latest numbers is uh, for the Department of Defense, there's 6,000 people doing security uh, for DOD contracts and, and also the um, uh, Corps of Engineers. So it's not 50,000. When you see 50,000, you know, your little BS warning light has to go on because what are they really talking about? There's about 6,000 for DOD. You have another maybe 1,200 or, or 1,500 working for the Department of State, and then the USAID has some of its own security as well. Um, in any case, the numbers are a lot smaller than what you see. And the $1,500 per day amount that people get paid. And uh, uh, that probably has happened. There have been people on very short notice. If you pay somebody to go and work for three days in Iraq doing a very high-risk job, uh, maybe you can pay them $1,500 a day. You're not going to pay that amount for very long. Currently, the high-end uh, salaries for, um, for the uh, Americans with the, all the security clearances and, and 10 or 20 years of uh, Special Forces background is, are about $600 a day, which ain't bad, but there's only less than 2,000 Americans and less than 1,200 actually doing that really high-end security work. And then it goes way down in terms of salaries, of course. You have maybe $350 for the average Westerner, uh, below that for the third country nationals. And when you get down to the Iraqis, you're talking about $400 a month to do security work. So, and there, of course, the bulk of security. Um, this is, if anybody's read Peter Singer's book, seminal book, The uh, Corporate Warriors, which was really, as I say, it really kicked off a lot of understanding about the industry. Um, it also, unfortunately, kicked out some myths, which are, which are, which are problematic. Uh, one of the myths was the $100 billion industry. And, and as a head of the largest association in the industry. I, I honestly wish it was a $100 billion industry. It, it, it is not. Uh, to get to $100 billion, you have to include not just the contingency contractors, the people in the field doing the, the security and the repairs and the construction and everything else. You have to include the people back in the United States that are repairing military jet engines. You have to include Boeing. You have to include Lockheed. You have to include the people delivering uh, pizzas to the Pentagon. You have to include the dry cleaners cleaning the, the general's uh, uniforms, and then maybe you can get up to $100 billion. There's no way you can do it based on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and in the field in general. Um, we limit our industry to the peace and stability operations industry companies that actually provide services in the field. And when you're talking about that, it's about a $20 billion industry globally. So that's UN, that's Africa Union, Haiti, Congo, Darfur. Uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and then it totals up to about $20 billion. And remember, of that $20 billion, 90% of that is the logistics support services themselves. This map is uh, right out of uh, Peter's book, which is a wonderful map of the world. And of course, what he's done here, every place was a PFF, as he calls them, a, uh, uh, a company or an individual who served as a private military person. Um, if they come from that country, the whole country gets blackened in. So as you can see, about two thirds of the world now is a uh, is covered by PMFs, and, and this brings up the issue of the Baffin Island mercenaries. Uh, if you look up at Baffin Island, it's actually colored black because it's part of Canada, and certainly there's Canadians in the industry, but you just wonder how many of, the, of these PMFs are actually located in Baffin Island. I mean, it looks impressive as hell, but let's, keep it, let's just keep things in perspective when you're thinking of the actual size of the industry. So why do we ignore the contract context, right? The 180,000 contractor number, um, Again, mostly reconstruction work. It's not supporting the military operations. It's doing things like rebuilding the railroad, rebuilding the power stations, rebuilding the sewers, and everything else in Iraq. That's mostly what we're talking about in terms of contractors. The numbers, they vary. Right now, it's about 120,000 Iraqis that are doing this work. Um, less than 10,000 people doing the actual private security work for the coalition forces, of which less than 2,000 are actually the Americans. Uh, globally, again, the private security companies, 5 to 10 percent. 10 percent in Iraq probably is, uh, is actually the private security companies. Um, elsewhere, you'll see the private security companies are a smaller percentage of the total industry. In Afghanistan, there's about 3,000 people doing private security for Department of Defense, a few more for the, for the uh, uh, Department of State. 0.2 uh, percent of that number is actually Americans. The rest are Afghans. Yes. 
Yeah, it should be less than, yes, less than 2,000 Yankees. Um, and in fact, uh, by putting 180,000 Iraqis to work, or sorry, 120,000 Iraqis to work, of course, you're giving them jobs, you're giving them a stake in the future, uh, you're bringing some stability to the, to the operation, you're creating employment. Uh, it's the greatest counterinsurgency project we have going. It's kind of inadvertent, but in fact, uh, that's really what, what, what ends these conflicts. Are these people unregulated and unaccountable? Well, we'll talk about some of the rules and regulations applying to them. Um, first question that always comes up is, you know, are these guys mercenaries, especially the private security companies? Well, here is the international definition, legal definition of what a mercenary is. It's on the Geneva Conventions. Mercenary, somebody who chooses to fight in a conflict, who actually does fight in the conflict, is motivated primarily by personal gain. It's not from the area of the conflict, is not sent by another state to participate in the conflict, and is not a member of the military. Which is to say, as, uh, as the uh, UN Working Group on Mercenaries puts it, there may be four mercenaries in the world today. Maybe. Um, it's a derogatory term. Uh, mercenary is simply derogatory. It doesn't help the discussion. Um, it's like calling a, a lawyer uh, or a doctor a quack or a, a lawyer an ambulance case or something like that. So when you have a UN working group on mercenaries, you know, I, I don't think there's a UN medical working group on quacks. There could be. I just don't know. I don't think they would call it that. The real definition of mercenary, as you see it used by journalists and, um, and people who don't know better, is a foreigner or a business person that we don't like. That is the real definition of the term mercenary. Uh, it's unhelpful especially when you're trying to discuss a rational an issue, uh, 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 an industry that is so important to peacekeeping stability operations around the world. Here's the UN perspective. Uh, Dr. Shaista Shamim is a uh, doctor, is a, uh, a human rights lawyer from Fiji. She was the last special rapporteur on mercenaries from the UN. Uh, when she came in, she took a look at the, uh, at the whole issue of these private companies. Right? There's a mercenary issue, by definition, what a mercenary is. And then there's, there's all these companies doing all these things. And she said, look, if a person or organization is not engaged in the violation of human rights or impeding the right of peoples to self-determination, it's really not the UN's business. It was very interesting. She's very sharp. She's actually now on the UN Working Group on Mercenaries. But she was the last special rapporteur. It went from a rapporteur to a working group because they didn't like what she was saying, quite frankly. Um, here's some mercenaries for you. These are across the uh, street from the White House in Lafayette Park. Uh, <clears throat> there's your coalition of the willing in 1776. Of course, they're from France, Germany, Poland, uh, all came to help out the US. Uh, we don't call them mercenaries because, of course, we like them. Mercenaries are, by definition, people we don't like. So. All right, so let's get beyond the name calling. First of all, you're going to find private companies, the private sector, are increasingly common in complex contingency operations. CCO, by the way, this is a term that the, uh, the Pentagon came up with. Uh, we kind of embraced it. When IPOA was created, the International Peace Operations Association, we took the uh, academic term peace operations and said, we are an association of companies that support that. However, we're, everybody calls us Orwellian. So I'm going to go with the complex contingency operations, and we are contingency contractors, and that works for me too. But essentially, they're more, they're, you'll see these companies all over these places. They're, uh, they're cost effective. They bring a lot of value to these peacekeeping operations. They enhance the quality of peacekeeping and stability operations. Um, they allow the militaries to focus on their mandates. Again, these private security companies are hired to protect things if you see them in these operations. They're not hired to do offensive combat operations. So they so you need, if you're in a UN operation and you have blue helmets, you have militaries from around the world, those are the guys that are going to be doing offensive operations if the UN is going to do them. Uh, in Iraq, the military is drawn a very thick line between what the military does and what the private sector does, is allowed to do. And basically, military says anything, well, it can be done this, explained this way. Military has rules of engagement. And the military rules of engagement are secret, they're proactive, they allow the military to use lethal force to carry out a mission proactively. Uh, what the private sector has is something called rules for the use of force, RUF. Very different. It's defensive, and it basically boils down to you are allowed to defend yourself. You are allowed to defend whatever you've been contracted to protect, and you're allowed to defend Iraqi civilians under mortal threat. That's what it is in Iraq right now. So it's a very different role that the private sector is allowed to play. And the military is very careful about this. And when it makes up the contracts that will include this terminology, it will make very clear that companies are not allowed to do the offensive operations. That is, the companies are not allowed to go after the insurgents. They can protect something robustly, but they can't go after the bad guys. Um, robust. 
the private sector is remarkably robust. And this goes back to my academic time. Uh, I did research up in Sierra Leone where there's a UN peacekeeping operation. And uh, yeah, there were a couple of times when the RUF rebels, the Revolutionary United Front, marched through peacekeeper lines and, and sacked Freetown. Um, every time they did that, it's very interesting that the private sector actually generally stayed while the peacekeepers fled the field. Um, the private sector has a lot of robustness. One of the biggest critics of our industry is a woman named Dina Rezor. She came out with a book called uh, Betraying the Troops. Uh, very critical of KBR, one of the companies in, that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it was very interesting that she said in, you know, there's been like four instances where the contractors have stopped running the trucks, the supply trucks, to the military, which is pretty shocking, but that's four times in five years, right? Um, it's not very often that these trucks stop going. They are willing to take a good deal of risk. As we say, contractors are risk managers, but they're not morons. Uh, they can quit and leave if it's too dangerous. You don't see that happening very much, uh, but they, they, they generally, when you hire a military person, ex-military person, they know how to judge the risk. They know how to mitigate the risk and minimize it and, and carry out their job. They're willing to take some risk. The same as a coal miner. You hire somebody to go in a coal mine, you want somebody who's going to be willing to take a little bit more risk to do that kind of job. It's the same sort of thing. Um, again, clients control contracts. Ultimately, whoever hires these companies can fire them too. And when you fire a company, they go home. Uh, private sector has to be seen as a resource. It's not a threat. It's not a decision maker. It's a resource to policymakers to carry out the policies they create. Now, policies may be good or bad, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. This is from actually a couple of years ago, but this is a list of companies, the top 10 companies, or countries, sorry, doing peacekeeping operations um, around the world and uh, for the UN. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. Of course, if you look at the top 10 there, you don't see a whole lot of Western countries. Um, mostly South Asia, they really provide the bulk of peacekeeping. China's kind of exciting today because they're starting to do more and more peacekeeping and uh, they have some real capability. So from a UN perspective, I think there's a lot of uh, optimism from that. Um, now, let me just show you a little stat here. If IPOA, just our trade association, we don't cover most of the companies that, are, that do this kind of work. We, we cover a lot, but not most of them. Uh, if IPOA by itself were a country supporting just peacekeeping operations, take Afghanistan out, take, take Iraq out, and just peacekeeping, and how many people we have deployed on these peacekeeping missions, we'd be 10th in the world ahead of South Africa in terms of personnel deployed. This is how important the private sector has become to making UN peacekeeping operations successful. In every peacekeeping operation in the world, and here's a handful of them, Liberia, the Balkans, Cote d'Ivoire, Congo, Sierra Leone, every one of these things, you will see the private sector there. When I was doing my academic research in Sierra Leone, there were 17,500 UN troops in the country, most of them in Freetown. Uh, and everything that was being moved or done or fixed was being done by a handful of contractors, from Pacific Architects and Engineers, DynCorp, um, ICI of Oregon was there, and a couple other companies. And they were doing everything that needed to be done. The, the security guys, the, the blue helmets were there, the UN was there, but the reality was the bulk of the work was being done by the private sector, and that was really interesting to me. So you got the private sector and all these peacekeeping operations doing, carrying all this, this uh, burden. Um, the U.S. military, I have, there's the last point, um, you don't see the U.S. military doing peacekeeping outside of Afghanistan and Iraq, if you want to call that peacekeeping. Um, that's really not what the U.S. military wants to do. And so as a result, we're filling those gaps with the private sector. I always like to make the point about Darfur, because people always ask me, what could the private sector do in Darfur? Well, you have a typical Western-less peacekeeping operation. Africa Union is becoming a UN operation, but it's still Western-less at this point, which is to say there's no Western military sub substantially supporting what's going on. The private sector has built every single base that the Africa Union peacekeepers use. It supplies those bases, it provides the helicopters, it provides the trucks, and it, and it keeps them serviced. Essentially, the private, private sector is underpinning the entire mission. So it's already got this critical role. There's no private security companies working in Darfur right now. But could they? Well, from a technical perspective, humanitarian security in Darfur would be very easy. It would be very inexpensive. Again, you'd be using mostly locals to do the security work. It would allow the peacekeepers, the Blue Helmets, to focus on carrying out the mandate, going after the rebels, the John Jaweed, or, or whoever the problem is. Um, and with a small number of security people, you can actually provide humanitarian security for the big IDP camps for the remaining villages and everything else in Darfur. From a technical perspective, it's not difficult. It's difficult from a political perspective. Two caveats, though. Even if you did bring in private security companies to stop the murder or stop the killing in Darfur, first of all, they have to operate legally. A 
company just can't go in willy-nilly. It's got to operate under some legal framework. It could be the UN. It could be the African Union. It could even, <coughs> and think about this, operate under Sudanese law. Why not? Just register the company in Sudan, provide the security, pay taxes to the Sudanese government. It might even make them more open to the idea. Uh, so you have to have that legal framework that they're going to operate under. And second thing that we have to keep in mind if you do this, it's not a political solution. All you're doing when you bring in private security is you're stopping the killing. That's good as far as it goes, but you don't want to keep the security there for the next 100 years. There has to be a political solution, and that's not something the private sector can do. Stop the killing, create the opening for peace, but you still need governments to come in and bring people together to end the actual tensions that created the, the problem in the first place. But I guess the question is, why not stop the killing in the meantime? All right, Afghanistan and Iraq. These photos, by the way, oh, here we go. Those are those toy for trash bins. You see the little toy for logo there? Um, the middle thing here, this is KBR, Kellogg Ground and Root, which has the uh, big contract to support the uh, U.S. military and global logistics. This is a great photo. That's uh, President Karzai after he was elected uh, or put in uh, charge in uh, Afghanistan. He needed some sort of security, and we didn't want to use our Navy SEALs to do it the whole time, so we got this guy out of Dynkor. He's, uh, he's former uh, Delta Force. He was about yay tall, but uh, very, very good. And in fact, they did keep Karzai alive, who was probably the biggest target in Afghanistan at the time. Now Karzai is actually protected by, uh, by Afghan special forces. Over here, that's a guy from MPRI training um, Afghans to do uh, uh, prison guards, to be prison guards. And this one's an interesting photo. This is the most international industry in the world. Those guys are uh, working for a British company the British company is contracted to the U.S. government. They are not, in fact, British, of course. They are, uh, I believe these are Nepalese. Maybe they're Fijian. They're all decked out. But essentially, it's just a really multinational industry. You get the best people you can for the best price and do the best kind of work you can get. Um, in terms of supporting the U.S. military operations, again, this goes back to my quote, best supported, best supplied military operation in the world, ever. Um, the U.S. military is about one-third smaller than it was at the end of the Cold War. It's doing more missions than it was at the end of the Cold War. And it's got this thing called 3000.05, which is this new doctrine which says the U.S. military not only must it do offensive combat operations and defensive combat operations, its third main job now is state building, peacekeeping. And so it's got this whole new doctrine that it's supposed to be doing, and it's never really done before, it never wanted to do before. It always does it, but it's never wanted to do it. So it's got all these things going on, and this is why it's looking to the private sector for support. At the same time, I would argue that the U.S. military is more professional and more focused than it's ever been. Think about this. When our military goes after a country, we expect it to win in days or weeks. That's, that's unprecedented in U.S. history, in, in world military history. It just We have a military that's so efficient, that's so good at what it does, you know, that we expect it to do these things very quickly. And the way it does that is by focusing its, its military into the combat arms and then outsourcing a lot of the sort of ancillary tasks that aren't so important. And what we found is that the private sector supporting military operations is incredibly cost effective. And we have the companies doing, of course, logistics, security, training. And what it does, the military is able to focus on its core mission, on the mandate, on going, in the case of Iraq, going after the, Iraq, uh, after the um, insurgents. And, of course, we have 100,000, more than 100,000 Iraqis employed uh, getting paychecks and having a stake in the future. Um, this model has been successful. We have, uh, I think, a quantity and quality enhancement of piece of uh, logistics for the military. Uh, an example I like to give is the um, uh, there was a wonderful article in the Washington Post about uh, soldiers going to Iraq. Now imagine this: they're going to Iraq. 120, 140 degrees every day. They go on patrol. They're putting on about 100 pounds of gear and ammunition and weapons. And when they go out every day and they come back from Iraq heavier than when they left. They're putting on weight. It's the most amazing amount of food and support you've ever seen in your life. Uh, one uh, uh, newspaper complained that every Friday night there was lobster tail and steak uh, in the defects, in the, in the cafeterias for the soldiers. And there is. I mean, the food is really good. It's cafeteria food. It's not like a restaurant, but it's actually pretty good. And there's a ton of it. That's all you can eat. So, in fact, our soldiers are actually putting on weight. If anything, we've gone too far the other way. Um, uh, the soldiers have never had this kind of support. The KBR, the Kellogg Brown and Root Company, which is a sub used to be a subsidiary of Halliburton, 
Um, the Log Cap 3 contract is a contract that is, was uh, created to support the U.S. military operation. Since 2003, the value of that contract has been somewhere about $26 billion, um, which is a lot of money. But look at this way. The Pentagon says it's costing them about $17 per day to feed each soldier, which is cheaper than it is in the U.S. And that's in the middle of a war zone in Iraq. So this is amazing cost, of, uh, cost effectiveness. Does anybody know what the profit margin of KBR is? KBR is, was called by one senator the, the greatest war profiteer of all time, right? $26 billion in contracts. What's the profit margin? Does anybody know? It's in the news every day. The company's in the news every day. But the profit margin isn't. Now, why wouldn't the profit margin be in the news? Is it 100%, 200%? Somebody said 600% once. The profit margin of KBR is 1% with a potential 2% bonus. Imagine that. It's the best deal the taxpayer ever had. And full disclosure, KBR is not a member of IPOA, but I always have to explain this because people don't quite understand why we use it. Uh, private sector has become integral to all future operations. There will be private sector. There has been private sector supporting the military. I think now we're seeing that they can do this robustly. They can do it cost effectively. So whatever we do in the future, after Iraq, after Afghanistan, if we're going to do peacekeeping operations or whatever, we're going to have private sector uh, people there supporting it. The log cap has been copied now by the United, United Kingdom and also Canada, something called CANACAP. So their troops in Afghanistan are actually supported by contractors as well. Uh, and as I point out to NATO when I give talks over there, any military that plans to be relevant beyond its borders is going to be working with the private sector. You just can't ignore the efficiencies, the cost effectiveness, and the, and the massive skill that they're able to bring to these sorts of things. Are there problems with contractors? Well, duh, of course there are. Um, it's the nature of any complex contingency operation. Things are going to be chaotic and there's going to be problems. At the same time, there's no excuse for not addressing these problems. And they can be addressed and they can be uh, improved. Um, you need flexibility from both contractors and clients when you look for answers. From an IPOA perspective, we have our own code of conduct. It is a, uh, a trade association code of conduct. We do take it seriously. We can hold our companies accountable to a certain extent. But there's limits to what we can do. We are not a government. We cannot throw somebody in jail. We cannot, we cannot torture somebody. We can't. We're not allowed to do any of that stuff. Only governments can do that sort of stuff. We can, however, uh, we have a standards committee. Basically, we have an online system where anybody can complain against our member companies. You can go on to the IPOA website, ipoaonline.org, and there's a complaint mechanism. And you can file a complaint. If you believe one of our companies are violating the, code, the IPOA code of conduct, you can complain, and, and we will take it seriously. We've done some other things, a blue and white project. We had problems with uh, private security companies being shot up by the military. We, had, uh, we came out with wallet cards, which sort of explained to the GIs exactly what to look for, the fact that most security companies are mostly Iraqis, and they may be armed, but they're on our side. Um, we created, um, we worked with the uh, PSCAI, the Private Security Company Association of Iraq, on uh, helping to develop uh, uh, regulations in Iraq for the uh, contractors, also for Afghanistan. We've done roundtables on contract officers, uh, reconstruction security. Contract officers, the oversight issue, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, that's a really key issue since 2003 is, uh, is improving the oversight. Um, and I'll, as I'll say later, it, it benefits the better companies when you do that. We do a lot of outreach to the non-governmental organizations that work alongside the contractors in the field. Uh, we work, out, work with the UN and others. And uh, my final point in terms of improving the contractors uh, is competition. There, if a company's screwing up, there's lots of other companies. You don't have to stay with one that's not doing the right job. Accountability during chaos. I don't care if you're wearing camouflage in the military or blue jeans as a civilian contractor. There are certain rules that you have to follow. There's international law. There's regulations. You, you, there's no excuse for allowing contractors to do things that the military can't. You're hiring companies to do specific jobs, and you expect them to do them uh, to the standards that, you're, that you'd like to see. And if they're not doing it to those standards, then you go to another company. The private sector does bring flexibility to chaos, and you need that flexibility. They're masters of the ad hoc. A lot of the, uh, especially logistics and reconstruction company, are, are former uh, uh, NCOs, non-commissioned officers, sergeants, and that sort of thing. And they're used to working in these areas and getting things done. And it may not be by the book all the time, but they certainly um, will uh, accomplish the task. And, and what we always emphasize to auditors and so on is, you know, was the ta task that you requested uh, accomplished? Um, we tell our member companies, do the right thing. 
I mean, ultimately, there's going to be times where you don't have the oversight, where you can't get a hold of the contract officer, and something has to be done to accomplish the mission. Uh, do the right thing. Um, you may appear on the front page of the New York Times, and if you did the right thing, then that will be uh, that will be a lot better than if you do the wrong thing, even though your contract said you should. There are various laws that apply to the private sector, of course. Uh, human rights laws, of course. MEJA, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Anytime a U.S. company is selling uh, equipment or services, it could be used for military reasons. You have to get licenses from the, from the State Department and so on. And these are the models that can be built on. These are models that can be shared with other countries. Um, they're all useful. UCMJ is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That applies to contractors right now. I don't know how they're going to do it. We actually uh, were against the idea of using UCMJ for contractors. Uh, when I started IPOA, actually, I don't know how many lawyers we have here, but when I started IPOA, I thought UCMJ would be a good idea. Uh, when you talk to individual contractors or ex-military people, how they feel about UCMJ, um, they're usually pretty comfortable with it. I mean, most of their lives, are, their adult lives, they've been working in the military and, and they've been under the UCMJ and they haven't had a problem with it. The issue is when you're doing it with civilians and working under contracts. And then it becomes a lot more complex and you have to be more careful on how you apply it. Uh, is a contractor not wearing a uniform who's wearing blue jeans and t-shirt out of uniform? Is a contractor who criticizes a commander-in-chief liable under UCMJ as a military person would be? Um, there's a lot of complexities there. And then the other thing that hit us at IPOA was uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And their point was, we don't want terrorists tried in military courts, much less civilian contractors, which is a good point. So IPOA came out against UCMJ. didn't matter. They passed it anyway. And so technically, contractors are under UCMJ. And right now, there's a whole bunch of JAGs in the uh, Pentagon trying to figure out how the hell they're going to apply this to, to contractors in, in reality. More realistically, we're probably going to see the media, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act uh, used, uh, which essentially says if a, uh, a contractor commits a felony, they can be brought back to the United States and tried. The exceptions uh, are local nationals who are under local law. So when they say contractors are not under uh, Iraqi law, that's, that's nonsense. Most contractors are Iraqis. Most contractors are under Iraqi law, for better or worse. The non-Iraqis can be brought back to the United States and tried under MEJA. And uh, there's been some expansions on that. We can talk about that during the Q&A. Uh, and of course, industry code of conduct, which as I say, limited as it is, it does apply to the companies. The companies that are members of IPOA do take it seriously, and the other associations have their own uh, codes of conduct. Uh, and you can hold companies accountable under the codes of conduct as well. Um, regulation and oversight is good for us. Uh, it creates a comfort with the client. The better the regulations are, the better the oversight, the more comfortable clients are in hiring these companies to do these sorts of tasks. So it's business for us by having good oversight and, and, and regulation. Uh, fair competition. Uh, one of the things that companies complain about all the time is, is they're doing a job and they're following all the regulations and rules, and if anybody knows what the FAR is, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, 18,000 pages of rules. Um, you have companies that specialize in working for the U.S. government. They know these rules. They know how to follow them. It costs money to do it, but you're supposed to do that as a contractor. But if you don't have the oversight and another company comes in and doesn't follow those rules and is able to underbid the, the company that is following the rules, that's a problem. So... Good regulation, good oversight enables fair competition. It decreases the professionalism. Uh, nothing hurts the industry when, as when a company screws up. And a lot of companies screw up because there's no oversight to see that they're doing the job the right way. Um, so it's a reputational sort of thing. It's tougher for weasels. It's tougher for these uh, sleazeball companies to work when you have regulations and rules that are being enforced. So we support that. The goal of regulation, and there's lots of new regulations that are going to be coming down from Congress, the goal of regulation should not be to penalize firms that are simply willing to serve uh, in support of U.S. missions and complex contingency operations, but to ensure the best results of the mission. The better you do peacekeeping or stability operation, the more people will be alive at the end of it. Some final point. The industry is not decision makers. We did not decide to go into Mogadishu in 93. We did not decide to go into Iraq. We did not decide to go into Afghanistan. We don't make those decisions. Uh, that is something that governments do. Uh, once that decision is made, the companies are hired to help make the decision work or work better. Uh, again, human rights, doesn't matter whether you're wearing a uniform or whether you're a contractor, human rights applies for everybody. And nobody should be in violation of those. 
industry supports regulation. We've actually endorsed regulatory ideas before human rights organizations and so on. Again, it's all good for us. Here's some of the rules. ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations, MEJA, Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, DBA, Defense Base Act, that's insurance. FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulations, DFARS, actually it should be FARS, uh, Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. Now, they're going to be coming out with the CFAR, which is a, a, a contractor federal, or contingency contractor federal acquisition regulation. So there's a lot of rules and regulations that apply. Um, that really hasn't been the problem. The problem has really been the oversight and enforcement of it. Uh, industry ethics, I think that's really important. That's one of the reasons we created IPOA, was to make these missions more successful through our code of conduct and other ways. Um, I always like to make the point that when somebody's in the military for 20 years and they leave and they hang up their uniform, they don't hang up their ethics. The people you meet in this industry are the same people that were in the military a few years earlier. Um, are we undermining democracy with our lobbying, with our efforts? Uh, please. Now, these companies are hired to support democratic missions. We may not like the missions, they may not be our particular choice, but they're made by our government. Here's my third and final spicy quote. Good regulation is good for good companies. We can talk about this more in the Q&A, but we don't have a problem with that. Now, IPOA, I came from, uh, I founded IPOA in 2001. I came from an academic background. I did a lot of travel to com uh, complex, what we call now complex contingency operations to see what was going on. Um, I was an academic fellow in South Africa at the Institute of International Affairs and did a lot of my research up in Sierra Leone. Uh, that's, by the way, one of those helicopters I was telling you about, the Russian helicopters working for ICI of Oregon. Um, while I was there, I had a chance to talk to uh, uh, literally hundreds of Sierra Leoneans. I had uh, and interviewed them for my own research. I uh, interviewed a lot of the contractors, a lot of the UN people, uh, found out what works, what doesn't work, how things can be improved, how the UN missions can be made to be actually more successful. Um, we created IPOA in 2001. Basic idea, so before 9-11, believe it or not, or you can tell by our sort of Africa logo, our original focus was all supporting peacekeeping operations in Africa with the services and capabilities to make the UN successful. We are a 501c6, which is to say we are a not-for-profit organization. We're funded by the industry. Um, nobody else would, uh, would want to fund an uh, association that supports for-profit companies, I don't think. But the goal from the beginning has basically been, let's make peacekeeping more successful. Let's get the resources and capabilities and, uh, and make the UN, the African Union, and uh, other peacekeeping entities more successful. Um, we have our code of conduct that was originally written by NGOs and uh, human rights lawyers. Uh, we, it's a working document. We're in version number 11. Uh, and uh, in July of this year, we're actually going to have a summit. And bring in some more human rights lawyers and NGOs and uh, go over the code of, our, our code of conduct and uh, uh, see if we can't improve on it. It's available online. Anybody can see it. It's, it's uh, at uh, ipoaonline.org. Uh, we advocate for good regulations and laws, uh, and we do a lot of advocacy and education for policymakers, for universities, uh, and for military, and basically help them uh, understand what the role of the private sector is, what the limitations are, and what the capabilities are. So that's about it. Um, I'm all for questions. As I say, uh, please don't um, soft pedal your questions. And if I can get a pen, I also can only remember one question at a time. And if most of these places, uh, you get about 10 questions, and they're six parters. So. Having private security forces in the theaters like Iraq has on the military in terms of morale, and uh, I've I've read in various places that you know for some of the some of the soldiers who are there they don't want to be there. They're being paid a very small fraction of in terms of you know remuneration. They're they're getting you know ten cents compared to the dollar that the private security people are getting. Additionally, as you pointed out, the uh, with secu private security people, if they look at something and see that the risk is more than they really want to take on, they can simply say, no, we're not going to do that. Soldiers can't do that. They are, they are under orders, and they're ordered to go in and do something especially dangerous. They have to do it. Now, so how, how uh, how is this going to affect their morale? Uh, 
Good, excellent question. Um, first point I would make is when you see the, the pay differentials comparison, is you're comparing a private sector American uh, doing security, usually for State Department, because that's the highest end, uh, to a 19-year-old corporal. And then you get that really dramatic pay differential, because, of course, the private sector guy did 20 years in the military, uh, went through all the special forces schools, uh, retired out of the military, and then, you know, with his clearance goes to work, and yes, he is getting more money, but he was getting more money in the, when he was in the military, too. If you compare the pay scales to uh, the seniority levels, it's much closer. And remember, when you're in the military, you're not paying taxes when you're deployed abroad. Private sector, if you stay out of the country 11 months of a year, you get uh, the first 87,000 are, are tax-free. But for the military, everything's tax-free. The differential is really not that much. And remember, the contractor's not getting any benefits either. Essentially, they get paid a certain amount of money, a big chunk of money, granted, but that's it. There's no retirement. There's no um, GI Bill or anything else. So then they're gone after that. So the price difference really isn't that dramatic. And you're comparing essentially the very highest end of the private industry to that 19-year-old. Compare a, the bulk of our security companies are, of course, Iraqis. And the Iraqis are getting $400 a month, which I guarantee you is a hell of a lot less than that 19-year-old is. So they're doing most of the work. And I guess from the morale perspective, ask the 19-year-old if he'd like to be out, you know, guarding the checkpoints, guarding the perimeter at night. Um, essentially, when the military comes back from mission, unlike Vietnam, unlike World War II, uh, they don't immediately go and clean toilets, cook food, and, and then guard the perimeter. Our military goes out on a mission and it comes back and it relaxes. And that makes them better the next day when they do the next mission. So there's a morale issue on a very small level. And usually when you talk to the enlisted men, it's not that big a deal. The officers, I think, have more of an issue. Um, and it's a mix, mixed bag. Uh, usually in the papers, they manage to find all the negative comments. But when you go and you talk to the military in the field and, and so on, uh, you get a very different perspective. It, it, it's mixed. I mean, some of them think that the, the private sector guys are arrogant or aren't following the rules. Others see the, the private sector guys as essentially um, making their mission easier because the private sector guys are doing all these other things that the, the military really doesn't want to do. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, I think we have to be careful um, that when you hire a company, especially a security company, to do something to support the mission, you don't want it to undermine the larger mission. This often came up in the case of uh, protecting Bremer uh, when he was there as head of the CPA. And you had a, a very strong uh, private security bubble, as they call it, around him. And they were saying, well, maybe that uh, actually creates more harm than good because the bubble was so large. Um, Colonel uh, T.X. Hammes, uh, a Marine colonel who recently retired from the Marines, uh, one of his points was, you know, this bubble worked. You kept Bremer alive. but..." You know, did you cause more damage by doing that? And Hamas's point was there's more ambassadors where Bremer came from. So <laughs> maybe you're going too far by, by trying to keep them alive that much and, and undermining the larger mission. I think the government has to keep that in mind. The contractors hired to do a specific job. And Blackwater, and they used to be members of IPO, they're not now. They do an amazing job at keeping their clients alive. I mean, everybody agrees on that. They may not like the company. They not, may not like the way they do things. But they do keep people alive, and that's what they've been contracted to do. But maybe we got to think to do our contract a little bit smarter and say, okay, um, we're not going to have this kind of, you know, the kind of security we want you to do is a lower key security, is a lower level of security, and it won't cause as many problems. Maybe in the future that's what we need to think about. But again, the contractors will do whatever their client asks them to do in the way they ask them to do it. Um, but yeah, great points. Did I hit all the points? Well, I guess the oh, other, other one who said, yeah, the contractors can quit and go home. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely uh, true. Uh, and, I, and this goes back to Dina Ray Zor's point that there's been, I think, four instances where the KBR trucks have stopped running because it was too dangerous. Um, there's actually been several instances where the military trucks have stopped running because it's too dangerous. And technically, you can take those guys out and shoot them. Uh, we haven't, obviously, but you do punish the uh, military units that do that. Um, a, uh, for, for KBR, they, they generally are willing to take a certain degree of risk. Over 1,100 contractors have died in uh, in. Um, in the conflict in Iraq and uh, in Afghanistan, I think that's combined. Uh, mostly Iraqis, of course, but it's uh, and that's rarely mentioned. But but a lot of contractors do they know what they're doing. They they go into these things eyes open. There's something called DBA Defense Base Act insurance uh, that's set up so that if contractors killed or wounded, they are taken care of. Um, uh, but you know, uh, KBR has a an old. Kmart store or something, and anybody who wants to go to work for KBR, they take them down to the store in, in Houston, uh, and they put on the show, and the show shows all these blown up trucks, it shows um, 
uh, some really miserable living conditions. And basically what KBR says is here's a thousand reasons why you don't want to take this job. And only after you make it through that and you see old people have been wounded and the, and the, had the uh, people, uh, ex, uh, their former employees come up and do their testimonials and everything, only after that do you sign on the dotted line. Uh, it's expensive for KBR to fly in and out. So they want people who are going to stay there. And I think they have, uh, last I heard it was like over 90% will finish their, their contract. Um, and some of them will sign up, but I mean, 90% of them will, will stay for the length of the contract. And that saves KBR money. It means you get you know, continu um, continuity in the field and so on. So um, I just say, you know, I mean, yes, there are limitations. The private sector can get up and leave. It, it hasn't happened, really, but it, it, can't, it could happen, theoretically. And I think the military needs to keep that in mind. I, I think they do. Uh, ultimately, they can feed themselves if they have to. And the first call for, um, uh, I've talked to guys who, who went for three months on MREs alone. You know, no cafeteria food or anything else, just MREs. In fact, one guy was saying for two months all they had was lasagna. He said he was ready to kill people. It was, a, I guess it worked <laughs> for the soldiers. But uh, it's not the way you want to run a, a mission, uh, I think. But excellent <laughs> question. Um, here and then here. Um, kind of what you said first comparing salaries to what people make in the military. Uh, coming out of Iraq, I know how much I made. You were, mil I, you were military? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I Army, know how much Army. I was offered for a Blackwater contract. I was making in Iraq probably about a third of what I was offered. Good. Uh, no, not good. It wasn't that much. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I'm throwing in my GI Bill hazard pay, and all that stuff. And it kind of sends behind to the right when I hear people make that comparison. Because the medical system in the military is not that great, and the GI Bill is not a whole lot. Um, so saying that, like, the salaries are comparative is, uh, for lack of a better Did, did you earn more than an Iraqi security guy? What's that? Did you earn more than an Iraqi security guy? Yeah, but I was also doing a lot more. Did you earn more than a third country national? Yes, but that's they the, also... Oh, that's the bulk of our security, is, is third country nationals and Iraqis. And yes, compared to an American who served in the military like you, uh, who goes into the private sector... You made sector. the comparison to Americans, so I'm yep. just following up on that. Okay, no, fair I'm enough. not a third country national. Right. Um, Unless and I had a question, protection. what do you mean by robust protection when you say that? Um, within the rules, I mean, how much are they allowed to provide security? It's been interesting, I think, in Iraq, it's a good question. Um, what companies were willing to protect or what they could be used to protect. And uh, private security before Iraq had been generally focused on the static security side. Um, in Iraq, they ask, uh, the government uh, asked contractors to start doing the, the PSD work uh, and the uh, uh, convoy work, which uh, generally involves automatic weapons and so on. Now, the weapons are lighter than the military has, but they're, they're still uh, um, uh, bigger than most Security companies Are you used familiar the with the uh, military's rules of engagement? Yes, I am. Well, they're, they're, there's different ones. It depends well, on the unit and everything. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with, you mentioned four uh, kind of, I guess I would call them industry standard rules of engagement. For well, no, the, 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 the RUF, the rules for use of force, uh, to protect yourself, protect whatever's in your contract, and protect um, Iraqi civilians under imminent threat. And then there's uh, rules of escalation. Does it get it. any more specific than that? Yeah, it does. It does. It, it gets detailed. In fact, I could, I, well, I'd have to blow off my, uh, my computer, but it, it's public. Uh, it was originally written by the CPA that was adopted by uh, DOD, uh, state, and, uh, and the Iraqi government, actually. So it's the same rules for everybody. Can the PSD it's shoot somebody marginally with a different between them, though. Can the PSD shoot somebody with a cell phone? <laughs> with a cell phone? I, I don't know. Yes, I mean, it really depends. They could when I was there. Okay. Do um, you know how many Iraqis got wasted just by being on the cell phone by PSDs? Uh, I have no idea. I don't know that anybody keeps statistics. I'm, that, I'm sure it's happened, but look, it's, it's, it's a bad idea. Has the military wasted anybody with cell phones? What's that? Has the military wasted yes, anybody with cell phones? I was there, we couldn't. Okay. Whether we knew there were a lot of rounds in us or not. All right. Well, fair enough. Uh, you know, your point's made, but I, I think... Uh, uh, so, while my overall point is, why are we throwing in... You say you don't agree with the UCMJ being... For civilians. Yeah. To civilians. Well, why not? That's the same standard I'm held to. It might as well be the same standard they're held to. I think you should hold people to the same standard. The law just has to be different. And uh, it's going to have to be civilian law, but it should be held. I think one of the problems with uh, media is that it hasn't been enforced. Uh, and you can have the best law in the, in the world, but if the Department of Justice isn't going to enforce it, then that's a problem. Now, there's some question of whether the Department of Justice is moving on this. There's a lot of complications on this. But you can improve 
Uh, there's been some 60 cases that have been brought to the Department of Justice under MEJA, um, and only a handful, like six, have been actually settled. Uh, but that obviously has to be improved, especially if you're going to use contractors, and you are going to use contractors in the future. Well, if it's the private contractors, when they break the rules. So let me go down to the next question. Get well, there. mine's following up on that okay. a little bit. My experience has been that there are a fair number of these third country nationals, um, and not just from Nepal and India, but also from Canada and South Africa and um, European. Australia. It's, it's interesting. The U.S. considers any anybody who's not an American a third country national. Right. right and, and I was just wondering if you could, you started to touch on it, but if you could just follow up on what kind of legal accountability these third country nationals have when they're working if, for okay, if, if they're working for American yes, contracts. Good question. If, if any contractor working under a U.S. contract or subcontract is under MEJA, Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. Uh, um, Act. Now, there's a caveat to that. And um, basically in 2000, MEJA was created in 2000, and it was only DOD contractors at that point and subcontractors. Uh, during Abu Ghraib, it turned out that the uh, contractors that were involved with the interrogation and, and um, Translation were in fact under the Department of Interior, which is pretty interesting because Al Gore had created this better government system that allowed uh, government departments to outsource capacity to other government departments. So the UD had gone to the Department of Interior and said, Can you just handle these guys for us? So these guys were working under Department of Interior, they're not Department of Defense contractors. So media had to be expanded and it said, Okay. Uh, this was Congressman Price in North Carolina who took the lead on this. He's very good on this, and we supported him on it. Basically said, okay, not just DOD contractors, Department of Defense contractors, but we're going to say any contractor working in support of a Department of Defense mission is now under media. This is, again, not locals, but everybody else, the whole nationalities. Um, at that point, then we have September 16th of last year, the Blackwater incident. Blackwater assumed they were under media, right? They were working in support of a Department of Defense mission. State Department says, no, you're not under media because you're working for the Department of State, and we're not working with the Department of Defense. We have a completely different mission. <laughs> so the new version that's come out that Price spearheaded and Obama on the Senate side has come out with the bill basically said, okay, then anybody working in a complex contingency operation for the U.S. government is now going to be under media. Now, what does media say? It says if you commit a felony, a uh, felony-level crime, you can be brought back to the United States and tried uh, in U.S. federal court, uh, and it applies to any nationality except for local nationals. And uh, now, it, it's tricky because that would be a violation of international law. So it has a little trap door in there and it says, okay, if we're taking somebody from another country to the United States for trial, their own country can, can opt to try them instead and then media set aside. But the rules are on the books that uh, you can try anybody from, from any nationality. And uh, again, it comes to the enforcement issue. The private companies get, get criticized for this all the time. Uh, when one of their people commits a, or is believed to have committed a felony, they can fire them, they can dock them their pay or bonuses, and they can send them home and get them out of the theater so they're not a problem anymore. And they can work with authorities. But beyond that, they cannot throw the people in jail. They cannot uh, prosecute them. That's, we're not allowed to do that, and you don't want private companies doing that. That has to be governmental, and governments have to step up to the plate on that. So, great question. Uh, let's go with this. Um, I'm curious if the IPOA code of conduct is a is a member self oversight mechanism, and if so, does that mean have you ever removed a company from the organization that's violated? Uh, we have not. We've had companies leave that may have been in violation, but we have not removed it. We have a membership committee, first of all, that doesn't allow companies to come in. They think are going to sully the uh, reputation. This is sort of weird. When I started IPOA, the idea was let's create an umbrella organization, get all the high-end contractors into this organization, and get the low-end contractors in as well, and get them all operating at the same level, the same ethical level. Because you're operating in complex contingency operations, you're not going to have a perfect oversight or thing. Let's get everybody a big group in the same umbrella. What actually happened after we created IPOA in this code of conduct, the companies are like, okay, we're in this association, we're putting our reputation in this association, we don't want those guys in because we know they're going to be in violation. So we actually screen out companies before they even come in. And then once they're in, then they have to follow the rules and regulations. Now, we have, there's different options. And honestly, when we created this, this online system, we said anybody can bring a complaint. We thought we were, we were going to be flooded with complaints, and, and we've only had a handful, to be honest. Um, but what we do is when a complaint comes in, we, we take it to the committee. If, it, if, it's in, if it's clearly a violation of our code of conduct, we take it to the committee. And we say, all right, 
here's the problem. Now, the committee has a couple of options. They can go to the company in question, and they can say, uh, here's this report that you have this problem in the field. You know, sort it out. And if the company sorts it out, then we've taken care of the problem. If the company doesn't sort it out, then you go to the next level, so it can go right up to expulsion from the, from the association. It has not happened, but we only have what, three dozen companies that are members. So uh, at some point it may. I don't know. But again, there are limitations. Ultimately, companies, well, there's two sort of levels of accountability. One, contractual accountability that clients can hold their companies to, and that happens all the time. Companies lose contracts or they get penalized or whatever. And then you have the individual accountability, the media that she brought up. Uh, that's another level. And then we have our trade association, which basically has to stand aside while governments do their work, but we can, we can still address the ethical issues related to, to contracting. It's another level of, uh, of protection. We think it's a great selling point for the companies. We think that uh, governments appreciate it. Um, but, uh, but again, we are not governmental, and we can't be governmental. We don't want to be governmental. We, we, will, we will address things from a commercial perspective and from an ethical perspective. Yes? I'm just wondering what audience this accountability mechanism is directed towards. Are you expecting the, the military forces on the ground to observe something to then go online and type in, hey, I saw... Anybody can bring a complaint. Anybody. So how many languages is it in? And if you're not internet money. connected because you live in rural Afghanistan, is it possible to log on? That's a question. No. I mean, you can bring a complaint any different way, any number of different ways. We made it as easy as we could. Ultimately, we're open to suggestions for, for further improvements. One thing we do is an annual um, a simulation. What we do is we bring in NGOs, human rights organizations, and our standards committee into a closed door session. So the human rights organizations don't even have to admit they're talking to us. And we bring these simulations, simulated problems to our standards committee uh, based on actual events. We fictionalize them, of course, but we, we say, all right, here's the situation. This company's you know, been accused of this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and then it goes to the, the committee. And the committee comes up with a solution or, or a next step of action. After they do that, we go to the NGOs. And we say, how do we prove it? What are we doing wrong? It's, it's a fascinating thing. We've done it twice now. This next year we'll do it again, and plus we have our summit. So, and again, in the summit we're going to be bringing in the NGOs, human rights actors, and so on. I, I still have to emphasize we are a trade association, we're not a government, so there's a limit to what we can do. But nevertheless, um, uh, these companies do care about this thing. It, they, it does matter to their corporate reputation to be able to follow this sort of thing. We hope that the IPOA seal would become a, um, uh, a point that the, the UN and others will accept as, as something that shows a company willing to live up to a higher level than they than but it is, it is just in English, or is it in other languages? No, no, we have about eight languages, I think, right now. But we'll, we'll, we'll keep expanding it, too. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, full disclosure, I normally work for the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. I'm DPK, we like this guy, actually. Yeah. DPK is one of your biggest clients. <laughs> so I can certainly confirm that on the logistics and support side, we've been relying on the private sector for a long time, and we'll continue to do so. And there's not much, there's not much controversy in that. Um, there are operational challenges on procurement, especially on a global level contract <laughs> management. But that's certainly here to stay, and I don't think anyone DPCO needs to be sold on it, for example. The question mark comes on the use of force, really. Uh, and there are a few gray areas. Uh, first on the, the, um, the private security side. I served in Iraq as well, and, and I went to quite a number. Of, my, my private security detail was from with the, the UN. Or? With the UN. Okay, but the private security we had was from the active US military. Um, for the, the time UN was getting its own private security now. That was it's later. security. But when I went in 2004, year, right? but yeah, in 2004, is, it was provided, you know, from from there. Huh. And you know, I, I can confirm though, is you know, it's not unusual when you went for meetings in the red zone, that you know there are four or five different meetings in one street, and you have four or five different security details there. There is definitely a tension there between the active duty military and, and Blackwater and others, where I, I found a lot of people echoing some of the comments in the active duty on the, on the U.S. military side saying that presented with the same situation or the same threat under the guise, you know, under the, the, the rubric of self-defense, you would get a different response. And at least the impression among Iraqis was that, that Blackwater would be a little bit less restrained. So there's an issue there. But the, the broader question I have is on your, the line you mentioned, that for the U.S. military, there's a very thick line that combat operations are not done by the private security Offensive operations. combat operations. Offensive combat operations. The U.N. has a very similar line. But your question on why not stop the killing on the Darfur mm -hmm. slide suggests, well, let me ask you, are you suggesting to blur the line? No, no. 
you, you're, you're hired to protect a village or an IDP camp. So that's not rolling in line at all. Um, right now we have uh, we have blue helmets, as you know, or not blue helmets, uh, African Union. They do the um, uh, what is it, the, the firewood patrols. Essentially, they go out with the women to collect firewood. Now, it's good because it protects the women, but it's kind of a waste of resources because you have trained combat soldiers doing that sort of work instead of going after the Janjaweed or doing the more proactive kind of security that you, you'd want them to. Right, so I, that can be done by private security, right? Well, because I've heard, and I, and I don't know if it's true or not, so please. You know, correct me if the impression is wrong, that there are some who have suggested in the private sector, they may be part of your association or not, that, you know, the response to genocide, you know, could have been dealt with if one turned to the private security. Now, providing security in a place like Darfur to stop killing on that level, you know, we're talking between 50 and 100,000, you know, armed I think we, are you, exactly. That's not anyone. Is anyone suggesting that from the private? Yeah, absolutely, and, and actually, it's interesting that the genocide groups are the ones most interested in, in seeing this happen. Are you or at least pushing this concept? Um, it would have to be done again using mostly locals to do the security. Uh, it would be um, uh, static security, essentially protecting. We've, we've had some plans drawn up by different companies saying this is how it could be done in a palatable sort of way. Um, it, it, from a technical perspective, it's not that difficult, uh, and it wouldn't. We already, in some places, uh, the UN actually uses companies to protect IDP camps. It's, it's not that new. Uh, the UN uses uh, private security for headquarters, for, for convoys, for warehouses and things in, in various missions. It just right. really depends. So um, we're just saying, okay, it's, it's always been interesting to me as an academic where you have um, uh, oil fields and uh, copper mines protected by private security, but God help you if you start using private security to protect villages and people. You know? uh, we're just saying, look, it's the same thing. You're not doing the offensive operations. I think you have to draw that line. None of, all of our companies have said we will not do offensive operations, but you can protect people, and uh, and that should be allowed. I think it, it's it's a shame. It's such a political issue. Um, it's, it should be a no-brainer. Could I ask you what you think the downsides are? Well, I told you the two caveats. You know, it, we become too comfortable. You stop the killing, and you think that the problem's over, and the problem's not over. It's still there. I mean, as you know, in Darfur, you got what? three, four, five different rebel groups, plus the Janjaweed, plus the Sudanese government, and all these different factions. Right? Just stopping the killing is great, but you still have five different factions of Janjaweed and the Sudanese government. Um, it's a political mess. Um, so, no, you can't, you know, Blackwater Armor Group, DynCorp, they're not going to solve that problem. That has to be a governmental solution. It has to be NGOs. It has to be reconciliation, community reconciliation stuff. And that's not private sector. But it's, it's one part of the solution. I think it's an important part. It's a part that's missing. I mean, right now, it's very interesting to me that the UN's had so many problems getting helicopters uh, for their mission in Darfur. They, they need two dozen <coughs> troop helicopters and I think four gunships, right? We can't provide the gunships, but the troop helicopters are no problem. Um, the, uh, one of our member companies, Air Aviation, is a British company using Russian helicopters contracted by the Canadians. Uh, they provide all the helicopters for the African Union. Not a problem. It's easy to do. That, but the UN's made a big deal about they want military helicopters, even for the troop carriers, and that's a problem. Now they're getting, apparently, um, helicopters from one country, and the helicopters don't even fly. Uh, point being that the UN will fix them and get them flying, so the com country appreciates that. But it's hard to find helicopters outside of the private sector or outside of the U.S. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that could be done. And, and uh, we put together a concept paper for supporting Monarch back in 2003, and the Congolese loved it. Um, and it was basically providing helicopters aerial surveillance. You know, I asked what uh, I asked uh, the Bill, um, I got to the Bill Swing, right, the head of Monica at that time. I said, you know, what do you guys use for uh, uh, aerial surveillance? And he basically said, somebody sticking his head out of the window of a King Air aircraft, you know, looking down. That's aerial surveillance. I mean, we have UAVs, we have uh, you know all sorts of high tech uh, infrared sensors and things like that that can be brought in privately, and that's all good for the UN. But you know. There's that little political barrier you have to get over that you're going to have private guys supporting the blue helmets, and uh, it's difficult. Good point. There. More. Um, has it caused any? I noticed that DynCorp International is part of IPOA. Um, DynCorp was mentioned in the New York Times this past fall as also having a very high shooting rate on its. So the first shot deal. Yeah. yeah. Not quite comparable to Blackwater's rate, but still fairly high. Has that caused any embarrassment for the IPOA? Um, we haven't had as many complaints as we had about Blackwater, that's for sure. But
But um, in terms of the first shot thing, you have to be, um, when you're up against suicide bombers, and the biggest threat for the convoys are the, are the um, PSDs, are what are called suicide vehicle-borne uh, improvised explosive devices, basically car bombs, suicide car bombs. Um, they don't shoot first. Essentially, the contractors shoot first or have to, or they will die. Um, it's a really, really dangerous situation. You're going to have bad things happen always. Um, you try and make sure that you have the most professional people and you try and make sure you have the rules right, um, and doing that you'll minimize the problems. But to say you're not going to have a problem in a complex contingency operation where you're protecting essentially the biggest targets in Iraq, uh, no, you're going to have problems sooner or later. And how, how do they handle it? And uh, um, you just try and make it as, improve it as much as you can, and then when there's a problem, how do you deal with it? Is there accountability in place to, to deal with the problem? I think the accountability part is fairly weak. It's a limit to what we can do as a trade association, but we can push the government to, to, to improve that aspect. Um, can you be more specific about you try to have the right people on the job? You try to make sure they understand what they're one of the One of the biggest issues is the vetting issue. You know, who do you allow to go into these, these um, operations and do this kind of work? Uh, what's their background? Now, for the Americans, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Essentially, you... Uh, there'll be a certain skill level. You have to be ex-military or have this kind of background, have this kind of training, uh, a security clearance to this certain level. Uh, you can't have a domestic violence or felony background. Um, and then that's sort of where you, where you go. But what if you're hiring Iraqis? Or in the case of Liberia, where you have Dine Corps training the military for the, for the Liberians, how do you check their background of a Liberian? Liberia was in war for more than 10 years, right? There's no records. Um, and you're trying to say, okay, was this guy a war criminal or not? We have no idea. Uh, there's a guy named Sean McFate, who was a wonderful name. Um, uh, he was from, uh, he went to Juilliard, actually, and then joined Special Forces and became the world's only combat violinist. Um, Sean went to Dine Corps and was hired to do the vetting uh, in Liberia. So how do you vet? You have no records or anything. What he did is I said, okay, if, if, the, if the recruits make it past the first level of, uh, of health checks and so on, um, then what we'll do is we'll photograph them and we'll publish it in the papers all around Liberia with basically saying, is this person a war criminal? So that's how they did it. That's how they did their vetting. It took a while, but they ended up with actually a much better retention rate than the, than the UN did with their police force that they were trained. Um, so it actually, I mean, it, it can be done, but it's really difficult. With the Iraqis, you have another issue. If their record was really good under the Saddam regime, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, again, another question. So. A lot of that stuff has to be sorted out. But if you have the wrong people doing this kind of work, bad things are going to happen. And the companies, we tell them, you have to act appropriately. You know, it's the, If you have a big operation, sooner or later something bad is going to happen. And how the market with good companies, how they deal with that problem once it does happen. Do they try and cover it up? That's a big problem. If they try and deal with it the way they should, then that's, that's what we expect of our companies. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much.